uh, of the um, uh, Princeton Minova Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, so today, uh, James, we're going to talk about um, uh, ga uh, gaps in primes. So I remember that in the maybe in the April of uh, 2013, Ethan Jan uh, announced a, a very surprising uh, result. Uh, he proved that there are infinitely many primes with a, a bounded gap. He even showed the gap is a 70 million. And uh, um, while a lot of people are trying to start his proof, then James in November, he, he actually uh, gave a simpler proof and uh, with a much better bond. The bond is probably 600, something like that. And not only that, and uh, in a few, um, uh, then he can show that there's uh, infinitely many primes with, uh, um, with uh, um, uh, not only get gap between them, there's arithmetic progression, infinitely many, these M tuples of primes with the bounded gap. This is a really amazing uh, proof. After that, he proved many other things. And I, I just noted that his lecture at Princeton is uh, it gets a re reverse order. So this, this is the last one, uh, really getting uh, surprised a lot of people. So, okay, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I myself really looking forward to what he can say about the uh, other, other results and uh, about the primes. Okay, so I turn this to the James. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. I'm going to sh start sharing my screen. Uh, so hopefully you can see my title slide. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, some recent work about primes in arithmetic regressions, uh, which is certainly related to some questions to do with Banner gaps between primes. So the main question that I'd like to think about in this final Minerva lecture is uh, one of the oldest and most basic questions in analytic number theory, which is just the question of how many primes are there, which are maybe less than some number X and congruent to um, A modulo Q, so in some residue class. Um, so I'm going to write pi of x q a for this count of primes which are less than x and congruent to a modulo q. Um, and maybe the most famous result in this direction is Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic progressions, which is sometimes called sort of the birth of analytic number theory. Um, and Dirichlet shows that if a and q are co-prime, then there are infinitely many primes in any given residue class. Of course, if A and Q share a common factor, then there's at most one prime in that residue class. So this shows that at least if X is sufficiently large in terms of Q, then you can have um, a large number of primes in any one of the given residue classes. But for the focus of this talk, um, I want to think about the case when X is not astronomically huge in terms of Q and also slightly more refined versions as an analytic number theorist, I naturally want to count the number of primes. So um, I'm maybe thinking of X being larger than Q because otherwise the question is trivial, but not astronomically large in terms of Q. Um, and you might hope that even provided Q X is just a little bit larger than Q, we can still get a fairly good count for the number of primes which are in any given residue class mod Q. Um, so for example, you could choose uh, Q to be 1000 and X to be 1 million and the residue class A to be 33. So we're then counting essentially six digit primes whose final three digits are 0, 3, 3. Um, and you can just count this on a computer. It turns out the answer is that there's 172 six-digit primes ending in 0, 3, 3. And in fact, there's about 172 primes in any one of these different residue classes, modulo 10 to the 3. So for each different choice of a, which is co-prime to 1000, the number of primes which are less than a million and congruent to A modulo Q 
is some number between 172 and 218. And so this means that actually the primes are very roughly equidistributed in different residue classes mod modulo q, um, at least for this value of x and this value of q. Um, and because I'm an analytic number theorist and I like to count things, uh, that's maybe the main focus of my talk. How big does x need to be in terms of q to get this sort of equidistribution of primes in different arithmetic progressions? We know that the number of primes up to x is about x divided by log x. We know that there's phi of q different residue classes mod q, where phi of q is just the Euler phi function. And so you might expect that roughly um, there should be x divided by log x divided by phi of q different primes in any given residue class mod q, which is a reduced residue class. And the ziegel valfitch theorem shows that you do get this provided q is only of logarithmic size in terms of a. So the ziegel valfitch theorem says that the number of primes, which are less than equal to x and congruent to a modulo q, is roughly what you'd get if you had perfect equidistribution, the number of primes up to x, divided by the number of possible different reduced ratio classes modulo q, and the fluctuations are small. But this is only valid when the modulus q is very small compared to x of logarithmic size. And it turns out for slightly technical reasons that for lots of applications, what you'd really like to do is to improve this range of q and to allow um, q to be quite a lot bigger than just logarithmic size, which would be saying that this equidistribution will kick in uh, quite a lot before x is sort of exponential in terms of q. Um, Unfortunately, um, there's a major barrier to extending this siegel valfitch theorem in any way, because to make any possible progress on this range of Q, which we'd really like to do from the point of view of lots of applications, um, it's essentially equivalent to resolving a famous difficult problem about the existence of so-called Siegel zeros. So Siegel zeros are possible exceptionally bad counterexamples to the generalized dream hypothesis, and they form a major obstacle in analytic number theory. Uh, we have no real technique for trying to rule out the possible existence of z equals zeros, uh, but you would need to rule out the existence of z equals zeros if you want to ever make progress on this range of Q where we can get equidistribution. So just to Recall questions about the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, the Riemann zeta function is a meromorphic function on the complex numbers. Essentially, it's fairly well understood if you're evaluating it on points when the real part of S is strictly bigger than one. And we know in particular that it has no zeros in this region. Um, the functional equation relates the values at S to the value at one minus S, which means that Sort of by proxy, we therefore also understand the Riemann zeta function um, fairly well in the region when the real part of S is strictly less than zero, but there's this critical strip when the real part of S is between zero and one, where we still don't really understand the Riemann, the Riemann zeta function very well at all. And we only have a partial understanding of it. And if you test experimentally, you find that the Riemann zeta function has lots of zeros in this critical strip, and they all happen to line up on this line with real part of S equal to one half. So the natural conjecture, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is the Riemann hypothesis that in fact, all of these non-trivial zeros should lie on this line with the real part of S being equal to one half. Um, the, a similar picture is also believed to hold for essentially any L function, once you've normalized in a suitable manner. And for Dirichlet L functions, the Ziegel zeros that I mentioned before are the potential existence of a zero very near to the point S equals one. 
So we believe a version of the Riemann hypothesis should hold for every L function. And from the point of view of primes and arithmetic progressions, the key L functions that we're going to be interested in are Dirichlet L functions. So in particular, uh, the generalized dream hypothesis um, is normally stated as for every Dirichlet L function, all the non-trivial zeros lie on this magical line uh, with the real part of S being equal to one half. And the reason we care about the dream hypothesis and the generalized dream hypothesis so much is that they give us a huge amount of information about the distribution of primes. So a completely equivalent way of stating the generalized dream hypothesis, um, instead of talking about the zeros of Dirichlet L functions, I can just talk about the count of primes in arithmetic progressions modulo Q. And a equivalent formulation is just to say that the number of primes up to X, which are concurrent to A modulo Q, is equal to what we'd expect if we had perfect equidistribution, the number of primes up to X divided by the number of possible reduced residue classes modulo Q with some very small error of size X to one half. And from this formula, you notice that this main term of perfect equidistribution is bigger than our error term, which is of size X to one half, whenever Q is a little bit smaller than X to one half. So one immediate consequence of assuming the generalized dream hypothesis is that you actually get this asymptotic formula for the number of primes in any given re reduced residue class modulo Q in a much, much wider range, which goes up for, which is valid for Q almost as large as the square root of X. So unconditionally, we were able to prove this um, when Q is of logarithmic size. But if you assume the generalized stream hypothesis, you very, very quickly get a result that gives a good count for the number of primes in an arithmetic regression when Q is almost as large as the square root of X. And as I mentioned, uh, from the point of view of many different applications, it's really valuable to be able to take Q to be um, some power of X. And so this is one reason that the generalized dream hypothesis can have lots, lots of nice consequences for primes. So this is essentially um, everything that we directly know about this question. Uh, we can prove things in a logarithmic range, but to make any progress on this at all, you need to start saying something non-trivial that we have no tools available to us about potential zeros of Dirichlet L functions. But if you assume a strong result about Dirichlet L functions, then you get this good equidistribution in a nice and wide range. However, at least when you formulate things in this way, in terms of counting primes and looking for equidistribution, we believe that the Riemann hypothesis isn't the end of the story, and actually much more should be true. And it's a conjecture of Montgomery that this equidistribution of primes in arithmetic progressions should hold even when Q is just a little bit smaller than X. Um, so you can ask, I guess I'll just mention that you can ask similar questions about polynomial analogs. Um, and in that case, much more is known. Uh, there's some impressive work of Will Sowen very recently, who's um, got results of this type. Um, but Montgomery's conjecture in the uh, integer world seems to be way beyond anything that we hope to prove. Um, Morally, this is uh, saying something like the low-lying low -lying zeros of many different L functions all equidistribute in some exceptionally strong way so that there's lots of cancellation amongst these different uh, zeros influencing the distribution of primes. But there isn't a natural analog for Montgomery's conjecture over on the L function side. And so you can't interpret Montgomery's conjecture easily in terms of zeros of Dirichlet L functions. So this is roughly the complete state of play of what we understand about primes in arithmetic progressions to some given modulus Q. We get some unconditional results. We have some conditional results if you assume strong properties of zeros of L functions, but we believe much, much more should be true in general. Um, 
and we face big barriers to making any progress on doing better in any of these senses. But if you look at the key applications when you might use something like the generalized dream hypothesis, from the point of view of lots of these questions in analytic number theory at least, often you don't need a statement to be true for every modulus Q, you just need it to be true for most different moduli Q. And so you could allow a small exceptional set of bad values of Q. And in this context, um, the bombier vinogradov theorem is an unconditional result, which serves as a substitute for the generalized dream hypothesis if you allow this small exceptional set. So for most moduli Q, so up to a 0% exceptional set, we do have the an asymptotic formula that the number of primes less than equal to x and congruent to a modulo q is what we would expect with equidistribution for every reduced residue class q for q's in exactly the same range as the generalized dream hypothesis going up to the square root of x. So this is like the Riemann hypothesis or the generalized dream hypothesis being true on average over the different moduli q. And the really nice thing about the bombier vinogradov theorem is that from the point of view of many different arguments in analytic number theory, particularly those in SIF methods, this is essentially as good as the re generalized dream hypothesis being true itself. Um, that you only ever need these results on average over Q and we can actually unconditionally prove them. So um, after the bombier vinogradov theorem was proven, um, there was a whole slew of different results um, which uh, were making unconditional, uh, previously conditional results that relied on the generalized dream hypothesis or things of that effect, because they were able to use the bombier vinogradov theorem as an unconditional substitute. Um, and you can think of the bombier vinogradov theorem as some statement saying that most Dirichlet L functions have most of their zeros close to the line with of real part of S equals one half. Um, so if we're allowing, the key point here is that if we allow ourselves a few small exceptional bad values of Q that we can discard, then we're able to say much, much stronger things. And we're actually able to say things comparable to strength of the generalized dream hypothesis in this average setting. So the bombier vinogradov theorem is a very celebrated and powerful result in analytic number theory. Um, but just as we expect Montgomery's conjecture to be true, we expect that similar results should hold even if you go beyond the square root of x. Um, and this has been a challenge in analytic number theory for a long period of time of trying to get a result of the flavor of the bombier vinogradov theorem, which is valid for moduli which are bigger than the square root of x. Um, so you're still getting equidistribution of primes, but now you're looking at moduli which goes slightly beyond the square root of x. So as well as this being a maybe natural technical challenge, um, this is uh, certainly very interesting on a technical side for analytic number theory because it goes beyond the region when the generalized dream hypothesis is immediately applicable. It also turns out that this threshold of the square root of x is an absolutely critical threshold from in the arithmetic of many important applications. Um, so one reason that this challenge is a particularly interesting challenge from my point of view is that morally um, it needs a completely different approach to looking at primes in terms of zeros of L functions because morally it would correspond to some sort of interaction between zeros of different L functions, which seems impossibly hard. And so even if you assume the generalized dream hypothesis, we don't really have any improved techniques for trying to solve this challenge problem. And then the second reason that I find this particularly interesting is that in a number of different applications in analytic number theory, there's some critical threshold 
in terms of your understanding of primes and alphabetic progressions, which occurs when you are looking at moduli of size, roughly the square root of x. So maybe most notably, there was the recent work of Yiteng Zhang on boundary gaps between primes, but also uh, the Titchmarsh divisor problem, Artin's conjecture on primitive roots, um, an old question of Hardy and Littlewood on uh, primes, which can be represented as the sum of two squares plus one. Um, all of these questions, it turns out that if you look at the answers to these problems, they critically rely on the behavior of primes in arithmetic progressions, uh, where the moduli are assigned roughly the square root of x. And so the Bombier Vinogradov theorem and the generalized dream hypothesis tend to fall just short of on their own handling these questions. But a tiny bit of an improvement over the range of moduli that you can consider, which goes into this region beyond the square root of x, allows you to come up with strong answers to each of these problems. So um, there was pioneering work of Bombieri, Fouvry, Friedland, Rivenich, and several others which did allow you to get some unconditional results um, handling, saying something about primes and arithmetic progressions beyond this square root of x barrier that's the key barrier in some of these arithmetic applications. Um, so lots of the results are slightly technical to state, but I'd like to give a flavor of some of uh, the results that um, mathematicians are able to prove unconditionally in this area. So maybe a first result is if you're looking at moduli which are slightly bigger than x to one half, so x to the power 0.5, no, 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 1, then you can say at least 99% of these moduli q have approximately the right number of primes in a given arithmetic progression. So it's weaker than the challenge problem in a few different aspects. You're not quite getting an asymptotic, you're just getting upper bounds and lower bounds. You're not quite getting almost all moduli q, you're only getting 99% of moduli q, and this is only holding for a fixed ratio class A, but nonetheless, this is unconditionally saying something which is outside of the naive range of the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and if you allow for a slightly more complicated setup, um, it doesn't really matter exactly, I don't want to go through too much of precisely what this means, um, but if you're looking at some slightly complicated average, then you can say something about primes and arithmetic progressions when the moduli are as large as x to the power four sevenths. So rather than just going a tiny bit beyond x to one half, the second result goes a moderate way beyond x to the one half. Um, and the second result from the point of view of SIF methods is often an unconditional adequate substitute for a version of the bombieri vinogradov theorem where instead we're handling moduli q, which are bigger than x to one half and can go up to four sevenths. So just as the bombier vinogradov theorem was able to act as an unconditional substitute for the generalized dream hypothesis, this technical variant of the bombier vinogradov theorem um, is able to act as an unconditional substitute for this strong version where we have notably larger moduli and that correspondingly improves a whole load of results about on SIV methods. Um, and then one final result that I'd like to mention is a result of Yi Tang Zhang, improved a little bit by Polymath, um, where he was considering just moduli where all the prime factors of the moduli were very small. So let's consider the set of moduli of size x to one half plus one over 50, where all the prime factors are of size at most one over a million. Then for asymptotically 100% of these special smooth moduli, we do get a asymptotic formula for the number of primes in a reduced residue class mod Q, um, where maybe the residue class has to be the same across all the moduli, but it's uh, otherwise completely uniform. Um, and this technical uniformity actually turned out to be very important for applications. So I've mentioned three different results, each of which are trying to prove 
results about primes and arithmetic progressions in this range beyond the reach of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And each of them succeed with some limitations, either on the size of the moduli or whether we're getting um, full asymptotic formula and the level of uniformity that we're looking at. But nonetheless, these results turned out to have lots of nice arithmetic consequences. So I mentioned already that this square root of x barrier, as well as being um, the barrier for the region when the generalized dream hypothesis might apply or not, it also turns out to be the critical threshold for a number of different arithmetic applications. Um, so one first application is a result of Fouvry, Adam, and Heath Brown, who showed that the first case of Fermat's last theorem is true for infinitely many prime exponents. Now, of course, um, this isn't as strong as uh, the whole of Fermat's last theorem, uh, which is known to Andrew Wiles, thanks to Andrew Wiles, um, but this predated Andrew Wiles' work by um, a couple of decades. Uh, so the key point is that these results about primes and arithmetic progressions can have um, strong implications in even fairly disparate arithmetic fields. And this was the first case that um, anyone was able to prove um, Fermat's last theorem or say something non-trivial for infinitely many different exponents rather than just dealing with individual experiments one by one. Um, I guess, depending on how conditional or not you um, viewed some of the, uh, some of Kummer's work and things. Uh, a second more recent application is um, Zhang's result on primes in arithmetic regressions yielded bounded gaps between primes when combined with the Civ theory work of Goldson, Pince, and Yudin. So um, I fundamentally view Zhang's result as a theorem about primes and arithmetic regressions where he went beyond this Riemann hypothesis range. And one nice consequence of this theorem about primes and arithmetic regressions was that you got bounded gaps between primes. Um, but as I maybe alluded to, um, there's a whole slew of different other results that get um, improved or solved using these results about primes and arithmetic progressions that go beyond this critical square root of x threshold. So you get improved bounds for lots of questions coming from SIF methods. Uh, you get good error terms for the Titchmarsh divisor problem. Um, you can look at one level density estimates for L functions and uh, break through certain thresholds for those. Um, it was an old question of Hardy and Littlewood about um, representations of a large integer n as a sum of two squares and a prime, and you can get good asymptotics for these results using results about primes and arithmetic progressions. And in each of these, the key threshold is the behavior of primes and arithmetic progressions, where the modulus is of size roughly the square root of the primes, this key GOH threshold. Um, so hopefully I've at least convinced you partially that this threshold of the square root of x is very natural when you're comparing it to um, what you get assuming the generalized dream hypothesis. Um, and this challenge of going slightly beyond the square root of x is very natural, both from a technical point of view, but also from the point of view of different arithmetic applications. Um, so what I'd like to talk about mainly today is some new results that make technical improvements of these on these ideas. So I view the main contribution is overcoming some fundamental barriers um, in the previous methods, um, but it's more natural to state the consequences of overcoming these barriers in terms of new results about primes and arithmetic progressions. Um, so one example application of the ideas that um, I'd like to talk about is that you can improve some of the original work of Bombier, Friedland, and Van Eich. Um, so if you remember, I had one result which said that if you're looking at moduli which are a little bit bigger than x to one half, then uh, for 99% of moduli, your, uh, the number of primes which are less than or equal to x and congruent to a modulo q is within 1% of what you'd expect for, from equidistribution. 
Um, so, so sorry, uh, the notation here indicates strongly that A is fixed. Yeah, so for this result, I'm really thinking about the residue class A as being essentially fixed. So I'm thinking about A as being one or two. This is maybe the most interesting case for applications, um, but uh, yeah, uh, there's lots of ways in which it's much harder to deal with things when the residue class A is varying. And so for this application, I'm very much thinking of the residue class A as being fixed, just as it was in the BFI work that I mentioned before. Um, so the BFI work said that for 99% of moduli, uh, you're within 1% of the expected asymptotic formula. And I can refine this so that we get the full asymptotic formula for 99% of moduli. Um, we'd really like to um, improve this to 100% of moduli because then we would have uh, solved the challenge problem at least for a fixed residue class A. Um, I'm not able to do that, but I'm able to remove one of the two limitations in that work. Um, and if you're a little bit careful with these works, then actually the numerology means that you can handle um, moduli which are moderately bigger than x to one half. So you can go up to size x to the 11 over 21, um, which, um, okay, it depends on your metrics, but I view this as a number a rational, which is has suitably small denominator that it's concretely bigger than one, one half, rather than just peeping over, um, going maybe one over a thousand beyond. So if you just look at the set of moduli, which are of size x to the 11 over 21, with some factor of size, maybe x to the one over 21, then uh, for asymptotically 100% of these moduli, you get the expected asymptotic formula in a fixed residue class. Um, so we're getting 100% of moduli that have some weak factorization property, even though we're looking at moduli, which are concretely quite a bit bigger than x to one half and beyond this room hypothesis range. Um, there's also, more technical applications. So I mentioned the result of Bombier free Land Vanich of four sevenths. Um, I can have a corresponding more technical variation that handles moduli of size um, essentially x to the power 0.6. So you can think of this as maybe going 20% beyond the um, Bombier Vinogradov range of moduli or the GRH range of moduli. Um, and so we're maybe one fifth of the distance uh, between them and the full Montgomery conjecture size of moduli. Um, but again, with various technical limitations, which is why I'm maybe not writing this down as an application. Um, and these improvements in the size of the moduli should just off the shelf give various numerical improvements to um, lots of different results based on SIF methods. That just as the Bombier Freeland Revenich result. Um, with four sevenths was essentially as good as some stronger than the Riem hypothesis uh, statement for moduli of size at most x to four sevenths. Similarly, um, you should get off the shelf improvements coming as a substitute with moduli of size x to the power 0.6 or so. Um, finally, one other application that I thought I'd mention um, is uh, this was a question that came up in an Oberwolfach conference where the question was, um, imagine the devil um, chooses for essentially every modulus of size um, x to the power 0 0.51, or maybe 1% of moduli of, uh, of moduli, which are a little bit bigger than x to the one half, um, one residue class. So he just chooses one residue class for every modulus. Can you show amongst all these different arithmetic progressions, there's at least one prime amongst these residue classes? But the key point is that the residue class can be completely different from every, uh, for every different modulus. Um, and so all the results that I mentioned before, which essentially were dealing with the same residue class for every modulus, um, wouldn't be able to say anything about this. And so it was a limitation of our techniques. And I'm able to uh, answer this question, at least if we're concentrating on uh, the moduli which have a convenient factor of size about x to the three sevenths. So if you have a factor 
um, of size about um, x to 0.42 or so, then regardless of what residue class we're looking at, uh, you not only get one prime in every single residue class, uh, but you get a, about the right order of magnitude of the primes. Um, and the key point here is this holds with complete uniformity in the same way that the original results of the bombay vinogradov theorem or the generalized dream hypothesis held with complete uniformity in the residue classes. Um, okay, so hopefully you're, um, you have some appreciation of um, that I've made some technical under the hood improvements to the techniques that are going on. And the consequence of this is various refined estimates for primes in arithmetic progressions beyond this Riemann hypothesis threshold. Um, so I view these as all applications of overcoming um, essentially, uh, maybe I'll mention it later on, but there was a couple of key barriers that prevented um, further progress. I've overcome one of those barriers and made partial progress on the other one. So there's still um, essentially one barrier to making further progress into solving the challenge problem that I put up before. Um, but there's fundamentally only one case that we really need to consider for the challenge problem, at least for fixed moduli now. So um, maybe I'll pause here and just check that there's no question, there's, uh, if there's any questions about the sorts of results that I've been talking about so far. Okay, seeing no um, questions or objections, um, I'll move on to try and give a flavor of how some of these results come together. So I guess these results about primes and arithmetic progressions modulary beyond this GRH range are amongst the most technical uh, results in analytic number theory in various ways. And, but I'd like to give at least a decent flavor of how these results are proven, some of the techniques that go into it, and maybe what the key new ideas I introduced were, which helped overcome some of the barriers um, that were there and what barriers remain for future progress. So how do any of these approaches attack counting primes in arithmetic progressions? Well, they tend to start off with some sort of combinatorial, um, maybe sieve decomposition, um, of the counting function of the primes. And the consequence of this is that uh, instead of understanding primes in arithmetic progressions, you can just, it reduces you to understanding, say, products of three primes or products of four primes where each of the prime factors is of a prescribed size. And for various technical reasons, uh, these questions about uh, three primes or four primes or five primes is much easier to study than the primes originally. So we want to understand various sort of products with a prescribed number of prime factors where we prescribe the approximate size of each of the prime factors. Um, and we want to understand these numbers in arithmetic progressions. And then the next step is to use some form of Fourier analysis to reducing this problem about understanding integers with a particular kind of factorization um, in arithmetic progressions to estimate in certain exponential sums. Um, and we might use for analysis in slightly different ways for the different sums. So in different regimes, you'll use uh, different types of for analysis. Um, but essentially, once you've reduced it to a question about exponential sums, uh, there's, depending on the size of the parameters involved, you might apply a number of different techniques to try and massage your exponential sums into some slightly more structured forms when you can apply one of two big techniques to try and understand uh, and estimate these exponential sums. So one potential approach, which was really pioneered by Bombieri, Fruvi, Friedland, and Raniach, was bounds coming from the spectral theory of automorphic forms. So fundamentally, this is based on understanding exponential sums through the Kuznetsov trace formula, um, which transports the problem into understanding Fourier coefficients of exponential sums, and then you can use ideas due to the Zuri and Avaniech on spectral large shifts and maybe progress towards uh, forms of the Ramanujan conjecture um, for mass forms 
to get good bounds for exponential sums of a certain structured form. Uh, the alternative approach is to uh, estimate exponential sums using ideas coming from algebraic geometry. So in particular, um, this could be the very bound for complete one-dimensional exponential sums or uh, Deligne type bounds if you're looking at multi-dimensional exponential sums by relating the exponential sums to uh, seed functions and counting points and varieties over finite fields. Um, but the key point is that we're doing some combinatorial decomposition to estimate lots of auxiliary sums we're using Fourier analysis um, and different Fourier type manipulations for each of these different auxiliary sums to eventually apply one of these two black box techniques for estimating exponential sums or close the black box techniques. Um, and there's then a game to play whether um, some of these techniques will work very well for some ranges and poorly for other ranges. And you have to try and patch them all together to make sure that you have a technique that can handle all the different terms in this combinatorial decomposition. Um, and so fundamentally what we're doing here is combining ideas from algebraic geometry and the estimates that come from them, which has maybe uh, played a very significant role in the work of Zhang with these Klustermania type estimates coming from the spectral theory of automorphic forms. Klostermania. Better to pronounce it correctly, Klostermania. <laughs> uh, okay, I defer to Peter on uh, my Dutch pronunciation. On, yeah, on Afrikaans, yeah. <laughs> the, the word Clostermania was coined by Huxley. I was, I was, I was only complaining about Clostermania. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Klosterman, yeah, Klosterman, yeah. Okay. That's right. No, but I mean the, the, the name was given by Huxley, and I do like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I will attempt to go for Klostermania, but my I'll probably continue to unfortunately butcher the Dutch pronunciation. So apologies to everyone for that. Um, so unfortunately, um, you can't just go through this and solve the challenge problem. Uh, there's significant limitations either both in the techniques coming from the spectral theory of automorphic forms and in the techniques coming from algebraic geometry for handling all the sums that you need to consider. Um, and in particular, uh, there were two key cases which the work of Bombier, Friedlander, and Ivanich couldn't really handle. Um, so the first was understanding five primes where all the primes have roughly the same size uh, so the product of five primes, each of which is of size x to one fifth. And understanding them in arithmetic progressions was uh, one big barrier for any of the clostermania type techniques, um, but was also the key limitation on the techniques derived from algebraic geometry uh, used by Yi Teng Zhang or Polymath. Um, and then there was a second uh, barrier from the point of view of Bombier, Freeland, and Vanich, which was understanding products in arithmetic progressions, where you're looking at maybe weighted products uh, of two variables of approximately equal size. And these two, these were the two key terms in the combinatorial decompositions uh, that they weren't able to handle using the spectral theory type techniques. Um, if you could come up with the means of handling these two techniques, these two ranges, then you would have solved the challenge problem of getting a good estimate and a good extension of the bombier vidograd theorem, at least if you were considering the same fixed ratio class A for all the arithmetic progressions. So this was really the two key limitations if you go through that work. And so the key new technical contributions that I made is I introduced a new idea which is able to handle products of five primes of size x to one fifth. So the first barrier um, I can completely deal with um, and I was able to adapt and maybe refine slightly some ideas um, of Zhang and Polymath, which partially handles the second barrier. So the second barrier was about um, products when the two factors were of similar size um, and I wasn't able to handle this 
if you're looking at all possible moduli, but if the modulus has some moderately small factor, then I am able to handle these products. Um, and so sort of you can think of me, uh, there's two key barriers. I'm able to completely solve, handle the first barrier and I may be able to say something partially about the second barrier, but it's the second barrier where, which limits us from solving the challenge problem completely. Um, so if anyone knows how to handle uh, these balanced products in arithmetic progressions for say prime moduli, uh, then morally you're able to solve the challenge problem, I'd say. Um, and so the key contribution is really these two technical ideas and it was just consequences of these of being able to handle these that we get refined estimates about primes and arithmetic regressions. Okay, um, I'd like to talk briefly about each of these ideas individually. Um, so for um, products of five primes, all of equal size, um, the idea is maybe somewhat technical to carry out, but it's very much inspired by the amplification method of Duke Friedlander advantage, which is a technique that's been very powerful, particularly in um, obtaining subconvexity results for different L functions. Um, and uh, just as I mentioned uh, in my talk before, that uh, analytic number theory often benefits a huge amount if you have a certain amount of structure in your sums. So I mentioned this problem of Hardy and Littlewood about representing primes as a sum of three cubes. And the only way we really know how to do this is Heath Brown's result that uh, there are infinitely many primes of the form x cubed plus two times y cubed. So making two of the uh, cubes being the same as one another loses you a huge amount of flexibility, but it gains you this arithmetic structure. Um, I think of the amplification method as in the same spirit, a gambit to gain structure. That on the face of it, you seem to give up a huge amount, but what you gain is a certain amount of structure within the sums, which means it's more amenable for analysis. Um, and so the principle very vaguely stated is if you're interested in some sum, uh, which I'm calling S evaluated at chi one, um, then often, rather than thinking about the sum just in terms of a single character chi one, uh, this character maybe naturally lives within some family of characters. Um, and so there's lots of associated sums S of chi for lots of different values of chi. And you can often gain a huge amount of information about an individual sum by looking at an average of the sums over the entire family. Uh, so a very simple example of this, um, I guess it's not really the amplification method, but this idea of utilizing um, characters living in families um, is the standard way of bounding Gauss sums uh, using averages of Gauss sums. Um, but here you can get um, powerful subconvexity results by looking at these artificial averages where you're getting a in print, you're replacing a, your sum of interest by, in principle, a much, much larger sum because you're summing over all possible characters in a family and you're only interested in one possible character. But by studying these averages, you gain the structure that comes from the family. And this allows you to quite often deduce powerful things about the individual sum that you wouldn't know how to deduce on its own. Um, in a slightly more technical sense, um, amplification. Uh, often is a means of uh, trading certain terms on the uh, diagonal versus certain off-diagonal terms. Uh, so it's a common feature in analytic number theory that when you're estimating lots of sums, there's some trivial diagonal terms and there's some less trivial off-diagonal terms. And ideally, you'd like the contributions for them both to be balanced. And, the amplification method is one means of uh, trading uh, some size in the off diagonal versus some size in the diagonal terms. And I want to do something, I do something very similar for 
investigating primes and arithmetic progressions, but in fact, it's almost the opposite that I want to uh, uh, reduce the size of um, certain diagonal terms at the expense of increasing the size of certain off diagonal terms, uh, which is kind of the opposite of the amplification method. So it's almost deamplifying certain terms, uh, but the spirit is very much the same. We're interested in um, a individual count of maybe products of five primes in an arithmetic regression. And to study this, I want to just introduce a completely artificial average over, um, so in this case, I'm just, the arithmetic analog is looking at um, certain terms in residue classes. So I'm just going to average over the residue class of the first two primes um, for being in some different auxiliary residue class. Um, so this looks like a completely idiotic thing to do. Um, you have replaced one complicated looking sum that we didn't really know how to handle by an even more complicated looking sum, which it looks harder to handle. But it turns out that when you start going through these uh, technical manipulations, um, what you, this gains a useful factorization structure in uh, later terms that appear. And it's this factorization structure that allows you to um, really make use of this gambit and it reduces, allows you to reduce the size of the um, key off diagonal terms that were preventing any progress in understanding products of five primes, each of size x to one fifth at the cost of making uh, certain off diagonal terms much worse. So um, the off to handle the off diagonal terms and to handle this loss by introducing all these additional summands uh, you rely quite heavily on progress towards the, the managing conjecture or the subreg eigenvalue conjecture, I guess. Um, but fortunately, you can handle all of these, and the loss um, from the increasing the um, off-diagonal terms is suitably small. That this gambit turns out to be a win, and it allows you to handle this critical case of five primes each of size x one fifth, um, and that allows you to patch together and uh, remove one of those two key obstacles that I mentioned before in the work of Bombier, Friedlander, and Fanyet. Um, so the second key idea, um, which applied much more to the algebraic geometry side of estimates, um, side of things, and this was maybe fundamental for getting these exceptionally uniform estimates, is instead um, inspired by transference ideas in additive combinatorics. Um, so the work of Gowers and Green Tau on um, versions of Semiradis theorem and arithmetic progressions um, in the primes, amongst other things, uh, really made good use of a of so-called transference principles. Um, and again, in a very wishy-washy, hand-wavy sense, um, I view the transference principle as saying that if you want to understand certain linear equations lying within some set A that you're interested in, um, you can understand linear equations in A if you can understand, it mu understand much more complicated systems of linear equations on some larger set B. Um, but the point is that uh, B can be much simpler and so it might be much easier to understand these complicated systems of linear equations on B than it is to understand the original linear equations on A. Um, but you can deduce results about linear equations in A just by virtue of the fact that A is reasonably dense within this larger set B. Um, and so inspired by the sorts of manipulations that these, um, that these guys use in their very additive combinatorial settings, um, you can try and use a similar tactic for uh, handling certain exponential sums. Um, and so there's normally two competing uh, factors in exponential sums. You have maybe some complicated coefficients and you have some complicated exponential phases. Um, and there's always a conflict between the two. I, in an ideal world, you'd have a simple phase and simple coefficients, um, but following these sort of transference principle philosophies, um, you- Perhaps say a, a little more here, what, just in words, what exponential sums are they over finite rings, finite fields, or uh, 
subject to nonlinear equations? What, what are we talking about? Uh, okay, so um, yeah, we're morally looking at some something that looks like Klosterman sums, but maybe summed over short intervals or something. But the key point is that you have uh, strange coefficients that depend on the fine factorization of the numbers that you're looking uh, at. Uh, okay. um, and yeah, what I want to do is, okay, repeatedly apply Cauchy-Schwarz um, and maybe rejig things at different times to replace um, something that looks like a simple Klosterman sum, but with uh, coefficients that depend on the fine factorization with something that looks much more like a um, complete exponential sum where I don't care about the prime factorization of the points that I'm summing uh, at the cost of making things uh, maybe much higher degree or much uh, or having many more variables or something like this. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so we start out with maybe relatively well understood and simple uh, exponential sums, but over complicated coefficients. Uh, we follow this sort of transference principle philosophy, um, although it doesn't work perfectly in this setting, um, to repeatedly try and uh, simplify the coefficients that appear, um, keeping track of what the exponential phase is, um, but the exponential phase is gradually getting more and more, more complicated at each stage. But ultimately, after a finite number of manipulations, you're able to uh, relate these to um, complete exponential sums, which then allows you to use these algebraic geometry estimates. Um, and in particular, it's these sort of transference principle inspired ideas, um, which allow you to um, handle complete uniformity with respect to the residue class um, uh, by just loading all the effort onto the exponential phase side um, and then having to understand a few relatively simple properties of the um, variety over finite fields that comes out at the end. Um, so this only works, unfortunately, if the moduli factor in a moderately convenient manner, which is why my results about um, uniform residue classes required um, some, some constraints along the residue class, and similarly, why I'm only able to handle 99% of moduli is because it at least requires some weak condition on uh, factorization of the residue class to carry out these techniques that are fundamentally based on uh, the Fay or Deline style estimates coming from algebraic geometry. So I'm basically out of time, uh, but just as an over a kind of pictorial overview of the different steps for looking at primes and arithmetic progressions, we want to understand primes and arithmetic progressions and using some sort of combinatorial decomposition, maybe inspired by sieves or something like this, uh, we can reduce understanding primes to understanding maybe products of three primes, five primes, seven primes, or uh, certain products where there's one factor very close to x to one half or one factor very far away from x to one half. Um, several of these techniques and several of these terms in principle could be understand understood before, either using uh, techniques from algebraic geometry um, in the spirit of Fufu, Kowalski, Michel, um, or spectral techniques coming from automorphic forms in the spirit of Bombieri, Friedland, Rivaniec, or Fufu. Um, but two key critical cases was products of five primes all of equal size, or products of two numbers where they have factors very close to x to one half. Um, for, factor, for products where there's one factor very close to x and one half, you can adapt Zhang style techniques and at least in the uniform type questions, uh, this heavily relies on ideas inspired by uh, transference principles from additive combinatorics. Uh, the other key case was products of five primes, all of equal size, which couldn't quite be handled by uh, the Bombier, Friedland, Rivanich estimates. But here, using ideas inspired by the amplification method, these can be combined with the ideas coming from automorphic forms, which allows us to handle products of five primes. 
And so that removes one of the key barriers for fixed residue classes. Transference principle allows you to handle um, ideas with complete uniformity and similarly adapt the Zhang style ideas to partially handle the other final barrier, which means we're able to make at least some concrete progress towards this, uh, what I view as a fairly fundamental challenge problem in analytic number theory of trying to extend the bombier vinogradov theorem to much bigger than x to one half. Um, I think maybe I'll stop here. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed all three talks. Yes, thanks uh, to James for this wonderful uh, lecture. Is there any question? I have a, so to speak, historical question. You said this Edelman, um, et cetera, result was the first time there were infinitely many cases of the um, first case of Fermat's last theorem. So does that mean that we didn't know and maybe still don't know that the set of Weiflich primes has density less than one, much less than that it's finite? Uh, I, I think that's right. I, okay, maybe someone in the audience knows better than me. I thought it was maybe not known that there's uh, that all but finitely many primes of V primes or something. Uh, but yeah, I thought that, um, yeah, I thought there were these various characterizations like with V primes or like using sort of the Sophie Germain type ideas but we had no idea about whether uh, there were loads of primes of this form or basically no primes of this form. I see. More questions? Okay. There's another, and there are two theorems like that. There's a, another theorem of uh, Fouvry, uh, which was used in the primality testing of uh, Agrawal et al that was also removed <laughs> once the problem was solved. So somehow this uh, uh, opens a door, an important door, and then, um, but um, you know, getting over a threshold there also was uh, what Fubri had done for the same reason. And it was used, uh, as I say, in Agrawal. Uh, they used it first, but then people realized you, you need much less, actually something of Dorian. And then uh, actually Lenstra removed that too. So <laughs> once you understand what's going on, uh, somehow much less, just like you with, with Jack, uh, if you make a change earlier, somehow the refinements which are here, which are very difficult, play much less of a role if you do something early on, which is dramatically changing the picture. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so there's no question. It's thanks to. No, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I do have comment. I, I forgot to to unmute myself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Please. Uh, now I would like to add something to the question by Nick, which was answered nicely by James already. But just to add something, I mean the this criteria before were more or less like twin prime conjecture business to get primes that that for for the Fermat, but then Adelman and and uh, his Brown generalized or modified the Sophie Germain criteria and required only large prime factors of shifted prime. And then the sieve methods with uh, exponents larger than one half in the Bombieri Vinograd type theorem allowed them to do it. So that's how it works, you know. So they did not, so they had to also modify the criteria, Sophie Germain criteria. Am I right, James? Okay, you're more of an expert on this than me, but yeah, that was my understanding that yeah. Sophie Germain said that you can solve the Fermat's, you know, maybe I'm simplifying slightly, but Sophie Germain said you can solve the first case of Fermat's last theorem for an exponent P if two P plus one is also a prime. So like a twin prime conjecture yeah. statement and uh, or four P plus one or six P plus one or eight P plus one, maybe with a, couple of extra conditions um, and uh, the Fuvi, Adam and Heath Brown type things were saying something similar that rather than 2p plus 1 needing to be a prime, 2p plus 1 just needed to have a sufficiently large prime factor and you could do more or less the same sort yeah, of thing. 
I think the, the history was Edelman and Heath Brown came, were independent. Edelman came up with it and Heath Brown also knew it. And that's how it became a, a joint thing. I mean, Edelman uh, found this variant separately. That's my memory. And then it became a question, can you prove it? I'm getting this large prime factor of P plus That's one, yeah. prime right. was uh, really a great, great challenge. It wasn't easy at all. Just yeah. recovery introduced a lot of combinatorics and cluster mania <laughs> to, to get the thing. Then, yeah. I'm very impressed. James changed his pronunciation in the middle of the lecture. Very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How, so you mentioned the Fermat, how, how they sin apply to Fermat? What is the, what is the proof? How do they prove this in? Can you apply to other Diophany equations? Um, yeah, so I guess as we were just saying, um, this was generalizing this Sophie Germain criterion for exponent P of Fermat's last theorem. And I guess that's already using quite a lot of kind of Diophantine structure of the specific Fermat equation. So, um, uh, so maybe there would be, okay, I haven't thought about this at all. Uh, it would certainly, it's certainly not a sort of general technique that would apply to lots of things. I don't know, maybe there's some Fermat-like equations that you could cook up where you can have a Sophie Germain type criterion where maybe uh, you can't automatically relate it to elliptic curves. Uh, okay, I pass. I don't There's really... actually, there is a class of quite a large class of Diophantan equations where you can do similar things. I mean, mm -hmm. you're just, you're taking Q to be MP plus one. So your X of the P's are nth roots of unity mod Q. And then you're constructing equations where you can't have a solution in nth roots of unity. And so, yeah, it's possible to obviously construct equations where that's a problem with finitely many Q. So you can create some sort of resultant that you would have to divide for there to be a solution. And uh, then you can relate it in a similar way to uh, Sophie Germain to P divisibility of the of the variables. So anyway, it was it was in the literature around the time of my PhD, and I have a paper on it, so I know about it. But yeah, <laughs> it is a thing. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah. So Andrew answered that much better than me, but yeah, that means I guess you can cook up Diophantine equations which aren't in the reach of the Galois elliptic curves modularity type techniques where analogous things of like of this type should hold and should be able to say something non-trivial. But they might look quite artificial compared to Fermat's equation. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. If there's no question, then thanks to James again for giving this series of wonderful lectures. <laughs>